Hi there. Thanks so much for tuning in to our LDB series, The Women Leading Visual Tech. I'm Abby. I'm with LDB Capital. We invest in deep technical people that are building visual technology businesses. We thrive on collaborating with teams at the pre-seed or seed stage that are leveraging computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in order to analyze visual data. This Women Leading Visual Tech series is one that we're developing in order to showcase some of the top ladies whose work in visual technologies are revolutionizing business and society. For this first chat, I had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Timnit Gebru. Timnit is a pioneer in algorithmic bias and data mining. Her research has uncovered deep inaccuracies in computer vision algorithms when identifying women and people of color. She showcased that Google Street View images can predict regional demographics on par with our national census and much more. Timna holds a PhD from Stanford, and she's currently the technical co-lead of the Ethical Artificial Intelligence team at Google. She's held roles previously with Microsoft's Fairlab, as well as with Apple. She's the co-founder of the group Black and AI, and she also takes a leading role in the Women in Computer Vision and the Women in Machine Learning groups. I really hope that you enjoy this chat with Timna just as much as I did. Give it a view. Let us know what you think. Enjoy. Timnit, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time to chat. Thanks for having me. Um, so I think we first met back in 2017 when you won our LDB Vision Summit competition with your PhD research, which was the Google Street View Images Estimating U.S. Demographic Makeup. Um, I know that it's been covered extensively now by the BBC, the New York Times, and so many others, but I remember when I was looking through your jacket first, I thought, well, yeah, duh, of course. Uh, Republicans drive trucks, everybody knows that. Um, but I know that there's a huge jump between my common assumptions and empirical truth. So what made you decide to dedicate your PhD research to this topic and why did you think it was so important? Um, so at the time when we were, when I started my PhD, um, a lot of people had been mining text to gain insights, but nobody had really mined um, large-scale publicly available images and visual data in general to gain insights. And so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to see if we could do that. We, we didn't even know if any of this would work, right? And so we had a, a whole bunch of questions. We had questions about whether we could recognize all of the cars um, in the U.S. Um, that already was a, a difficult task because we had to assemble a data set and things like this. Um, and then we had well, we had another question if we could gain any any sort of association with people and the cars they drive in the U.S. from the visual data. Um, so even though it was kind of like a simple question, it took <laughs> almost my entire PhD and many many like my co my uh, co author's PhD too. He worked um, for at least two years on this project full time alongside me. Um, and but the the interesting thing is um, I started to realize you know this kind of uh, approach can be used for many things that can be good or bad so for example um, there are places where you know if you if, if it's very difficult to get survey data you could try to use visual data to understand like poverty rates in certain places or health outcomes or how many schools there are in certain locations things like this but I also saw um, very recently I saw an MIT tech review article which was like Oh, in 2017, a team of researchers showed this with cars on Google Street View. Now, a team of researchers at Stanford is associating the home you live in from Google Street View with uh, your insurance, like your um, uh, like likelihood of being in a car accident. And insurance companies can use this and stuff. I was like, oh no, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you know, and so that's kind of actually one of the reasons I started um, really moving into kind of the the my areas of focus now, which is trying to understand um, algorithmic bias and and, and uh, bias in models and data sets, and not just like uh, bias in the data and training data, but just kind of like ethics and like you know what's what's okay to do, what's okay not to do, and the power dynamics of you know who has data, who doesn't have data, like who who has access to certain kinds of models, who doesn't, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, considering a lot of the, the questions that we have right now about the U.S. Census and how it's going to be able to accurately track people, especially when there's so many immigrants who are afraid of, yeah. of answering it, do you think that this could be one of the ways in which it is actually a powerful very, tool? Um, 
Very interesting. I was actually thinking about this because I was talking to Dana Boyd when I was at Microsoft Research, and she is one of the most knowledgeable people I know in terms of the census. Mm -hmm. So she like knows everything there is to know about the census. And so she was talking to me how about how it's going to be contentious in 2020. And I was telling her, I was like, it would be really great if you had a body that is not as a, by, a, not associated with, uh, you know, the government really like it's like a, a research mm -hmm. consortium or whatever it is, like an independent institution that does its own uh, kind of census, but it does it, um, um, using publicly available data and, and, uh, okay. so I, sorry, I have to mute my, uh, my chat. No good. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No and way. so, um, I just did that. Um, yeah, so I was, I was actually, I remember like being really excited about that idea of like doing census, um, using other means and at least to be able to check which parts seem off, right? Like which parts of the U.S. census seem really off. Um, and so maybe that could be like a check. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about this um, a year or two ago and I, I, I still think it would be a very good idea. That's great. I mean, it sounds like between Dr. Lee and Dr. Boyd that, Boyd, that you've got some very strong female mentors in the yeah. space that you've been working with. But outside of the two of them, you know, whether it was at Stanford in your lab or um, at the FAIR lab at Microsoft, how many other women were you working with? So actually at Microsoft Research, I worked with a lot of senior vocal women and um that i didn't realize how unusual that was you know <laughs> um you know because uh a lot of times you know it, i i wasn't the, the the loud one or the problematic one the opinionated <laughs> one or whatever you know i would just go into a room like i remember we had like this offsite or something and i went into a room and there were so many loud, opinionated women like leading sessions, and they they weren't afraid to. Um, I, I remember, you know, I I was leading some session, and I said to Jennifer Chase was talking, and I was like, "Hey, I know you're my boss, but I'm gonna start," you know, and <laughs> and I think she said like, you know, the less you respect authority, the more I like you. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, I mean, I worked with you know, so many of them, um, Hannah Wallach, Jennifer, uh, Jen Wartman Vaughn, like, you know, uh, Dana was there, I, uh, Kate Crawford was around, you know, Chandra, like I saw, and then Nicole, like even if pe I didn't work with people directly, there were just a whole bunch of women around. Um, I remember that at one point, I mean, it's a small office in New York City, but at one point there was um, three Ethiopian women there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what, uh, researchers, right? Like I was a postdoc. Um, Chandra was um, a researcher, and then Reddit was there, who's my co-founder for Black and AI, as an intern. And we took a picture because I was like, "This is never gonna happen ever <laughs> in my life." You know, in one of these companies, in one like one little office, you have three, you know, Ethiopian women, let alone like women. So, so that's a very unusual kind of um, place to be in. And and right now at Google. I, so I'm working with a great women. I'm working with um, Alex Hannes, who's, who's really great. Um, Meg Mitchell, who's been a collaborator of mine for a long time. But I actually, the, the issue is that I don't see a lot of vocal senior women. I'm like the problematic mm -hmm. one there. So I'm like, <laughs> wow, and then like, you know, they're kind of a little like, oh, what she's gonna, what's she gonna say now? Or, you know, I, I don't feel at all that I'm in good company when I'm <laughs> saying, um, and, but I have a lot of peers who appreciate, you know, like my manager, Sammy, he mm -hmm. always lets me know like how much he appreciates me speaking up, but, I, but I'm not like, you know, I don't feel, I don't go into a room and I, I feel like I'm um, in a room full of loud opinionated women. I feel more like I'm in a room full of kind of uh, quiet women who are not supposed, like who are not supposed to do what I'm doing. That's how I feel. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. But do you, you know, I know I, I saw that you've got two sisters who are both engineers as well. Yeah. You come from like a long line of engineers. Was there a specific point in time when you decided that, that this was the route that you were going to take and, you know, have, have continued along that path after that decision? You know, I um ever since I was a little kid, like when people asked me what I wanted to be, I would say I wanted to be a scientist. 
um and i'm not exactly sure where like i think i was always i always loved learning i was such a nerd you know i was like <laughs> it was just so strange i when i was in um kindergarten like if they don't if they didn't give me um homework i would cry and so they would like give me my own <laughs> special homework i would go complain apparently like my cousin was telling me that <clears throat> i was complaining to my dad that my sisters are not teaching me how to read and i want to like i want you know <laughs> them to teach me how to read and they're saying no and like and then um i remember even later when i was in school i i i always wanted to go to school because i i think it's it's like you know playing with other kids and stuff like that you know you have this these um stereotypes of kids kind of faking being sick because they don't they want to be home you know school yeah. sick and i was the opposite i would there's a time even when my mom, I had hepatitis, you know, when I was five years old wow. <clears throat> because I, um, I drank some, um, you know, a dirty water from the ground or whatever. I don't know what I did. And instead, and uh, my mom wanted me to stay home and I like wanted to hide it from her because I didn't want to stay home. And she had to just, you know, bribe me with all sorts of things in order to stay home. <laughs> and I was so upset. I am, I was, I was really upset. And she was, she was telling me all sorts of things about like what I was doing because I was upset. So, you know, I always liked learning, but, um, and, um, later on, because I always liked science, I, I never even questioned kind of whether or not to go into engineering. My dad was an electrical engineer. Um, he's actually mm. the first, like, you know he's the first one to go to college not you know his parents were not educated um so he was you know like an electrical electrical engineer i didn't even know he had his phd but he got his phd in P padua university in italy and then my oldest sister my two sisters are 10 years old 10 and 11 years older than me and so my oldest sister studied electrical engineering i don't know why she chose that i, I feel i actually have never asked her i just never questioned it <laughs> and then my middle sister also did that and i just kind of it felt like oh okay you know i like physics and it seems like a mm -hmm. kind of a more i don't know like a, if i were to go into engineering that felt like the one to go to so i just never really questioned it i just did that <laughs> Okay. Oh, I hope that my daughter will aspire to the same kinds of things from a school perspective. She's two and she literally just played hooky the other day and shaked the oh. stomach ache to get picked up. Like, oh, no. No, no. no uh -huh. you know, and then but. later, I, uh, it's, it's only when I was younger, though, because later, I, I mean, I obviously, I still like learning and I got a PhD, but later on, I started not liking the structure of school. Like, I just wanted mm. to be left alone. I, I didn't want to have to worry about grades or you know, have to do this homework and then that thing. You know, I, I just didn't, later on, I didn't like it as much, but earlier yeah. I had a, you know, I don't know for some reason <laughs> I liked it. Yeah. A thirst for learning. That, I think that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Has there been like a moment in your career so far that, that you would consider your most defining event? Um, I think that's probably, Probably it's when I went to, I always talk about this when people ask me about Black and AI and you know how it started and all that. Um, when I went to New Europe's, um in 2016, um, well, I mean, that's the most recent one I would say. I mean, I guess like um, I, I've had many, I've had a, a few other kind of like moments where I freaked out or something like that. But like um, in New Europe's in 2016, I, um, uh, I, w I went to Barcelona, and so that was only my second time at New Europe's. It was 2015 was the, the first time I went, and I didn't have a good experience. I felt very isolated. I felt like an outsider, just that this is not for me, you know? Um, and so in 2016, it was much larger, um, and I, I believe now the accurate numbers, like there was like 5,500 people or something like that. Now, you know, this year, I think they have their venue can hold 15,000 people. Last wow. year in Montreal was like 8,500 was, and it was sold out in like 11 minutes or something like that. But anyway, so I go to Barcelona, you know, and um, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's just pe like rows and rows and rows of like people and not a single person looks like me, right? Like there's barely any women barely any like Africans or African Americans or anybody who's black mm -hmm. or, you know, it's not just even just color or race. It's just also just culture, everything, right? Like it just kind of was so, so obvious that, that um, like we weren't here. And then, but then at the same time, it was around the time when like a lot of people were talking about just 
AI all of a sudden was just like AI, AI was all over the news. It was like open AI starting, I think they're Europe. Before. I don't know. It just felt like there was a lot of activity. And um and also that was when the a ProPublica article had come out about crime recidivism uh, and how there was an a uh, a like the a startup that was selling software to uh quote unquote like determine your likelihood of committing a crime again and they were like sending it to judges and stuff so and then i remember you know um in grad school is very isolating because there's literally i mean undergrad at stanford is very different there's a lot more diversity than graduate school is mm. the complete opposite you know you feel because i had already started grad school before and then i left because i was just like it was too isolating mm. so the confluence of those things. And then I had been kind of talking to Joy and advising her, I believe, on her master. We had already started working together on her master's thesis at that time. So I was kind of, I was aware of all the issues that she was kind of uncovering, right, um, with um, case detection systems. Yeah. And so... Just to, just to give a little bit of background um, for anybody who's listening. Um, so Joy Bulomini, who you're talking about at MIT, um, is the co-author of your research on gender shades. And so it sounds like this is kind of the origination for the gender shades that came a few years later, right? <laughs> yeah, and so it's her. It's based on her master's thesis, and so she had been kind of giving talks about the, this this issue. Um, and so, so based, when I came back from Europe's um, in 2016, I just came back basically with a feeling of like panic and just like what is going on, you know? Wow. Yeah. And so I like I wrote this Facebook post. And I was just like, you know, I was at New Europe's and there was, I counted five black people out of an estimated, I thought it was like, I thought the estimate was 8,500 um, people. And I was just like, hey, um, and, you know, there's like, you know, when you have drones, like who's going to be the person that who's considered a uh, terrorist versus not like, there's many things that work, you know, for certain groups of people that don't work for other groups of people. And then people talk about diversity, but they talk about it like it's a charity or something and they pay lip service. I just went on and I just went off oh, on there. Man. And I was like, AI is a system and the people who are, you know, creating it are part of a system. And if they're not considered part of a system, we're going to like create technology that's harming, that harms a lot of people. And so I would say that like that moment was kind of when I really felt the urgency of, of, of kind of doing something about about some of the issues that I was seeing. Well, I mean, it's so great because it sounds like, you know, you started off with having this, all of these great women mentors once you entered the workforce, but it was really an isolating experience as you went through, through your grad studies. And I'm sure that's yeah. what a lot of people, people face as they were going through it. Um, and so then you had this like illuminating moment that this is something that you wanted to work on and shape. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what Gender Shades has found? Because when did you guys release that research? Last year? Uh, when did we publish it? Um, I, I believe it was published is either February or March of 2018. 2018 okay. is when it was published, but um, but we had been working on it for a while. So Joy had, you know, I remember, um, so what? How, how I met her was that like a friend of mine who's also a Rhodes Scholar at Stanford um, was just like, I, I don't even know how, how, how we were talking about things. And she kind of, gathered that I would be interested in this kind of stuff. And so Joy had sent an email to the Rhodes Scholar mailing list asking about, I believe it's someone interested in computer vision or something. I don't remember now. Mm. And I re and my friend forwarded it to me. And then I um, emailed Joy and I was like, hey, I, I, you know, your work is really important. And I'm like, can I be your friend? And I was, <laughs> not exactly, but like your work is really important. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to connect. And so that's how we connected. And I think I don't know if that was in 2016. I think it was earlier. It's probably like 2015, end of 2015 wow. or something like that. And um, so uh, she was uh, doing her master's at MIT at that time, and she was trying to think about her master's thesis. And so we were just we were meeting at least once a week and talking. And and so I was advising her on a master's thesis. And then once um you know she was done with her thesis um the Fat Star Conference um, was announced for the first time, right? Like I was in the steering committee. And so this was basically the first conference I could think of um, that could, that work like that could be um, published in. Mm -hmm. And so 
um, I, I think, and then so when I, by then I, I was um, finishing up grad school and then when I, I joined MSR in New York and um, I, I think it was around September or something, I was like, oh, hey, like there's this new conference that, that maybe, you know, we can take a piece of your, your research, uh, your, your thesis and publish it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then, yeah, we took a piece of it and kind of repackaged it for a conference paper and and that's kind of what uh, what what became gender shapes that's great what do you think you know if you could sum it up in one sentence what is the biggest um, meaning for society that comes out of that research um i think that that research um opened people's eyes into a how much um AI like was being used in everyday products that you're paying for, you know, and B, mm -hmm. um, how much disparity there is um, across groups in terms of what works best for which group. Um, and, and so like it made, it made people question, you know, their data, um, how like using these kinds of systems and high stakes scenarios. Um, I saw articles from um, doctors in medicine citing our work and healthcare, you know, and, and, and all sorts of uh, places. So that's what I, I, I'm happy to see that discussion. The thing I think some people or a lot of people sometimes miss is the discussion around, um, so a lot of people are focused on the diversification of data sets and not enough on um, questioning the task itself. Um, and also the way to gather data sets. So sometimes like, you know, so Ruha Benjamin has this term predatory inclusion. She has this, this book that race after technologies is such a great book that just mm -hmm. came out. She discusses, you know, this, this notion of predatory inclusion where you know, it's, 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 a, it's for the benefit of, you know, you that you're kind of trying to quote unquote include these marginalized communities, but it, not for their benefit they don't you know you don't include them in the whole process uh, from the very beginning right like you kind of include them because oh you need to diversify your data set or whatever and you might do it in a way that's actually predatory um and and not ethical and so, so do you think that this is you know um being mindful of these things do you think that this is one of the ways in which um we can correct it now in order to make sure that the structural biases of our society day are left out of these algorithms that are going to define our tomorrow. I think that um, it's such a complex. Uh, I, I think that there are so many things that need to happen, um, and so I think that one is kind of understanding the lay of the land, like where all of this stuff is being used, where the data is coming from, who owns the data, who doesn't own the data. Two is 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 just like I said, also questioning the test. So for gender shades, we use the text of automatic gender recognition um, mm -hmm. as, as a test bed to show like some of these issues. But actually, you know, a lot of people have written about the fact that automatic gender recognition tools should actually not exist in the first place. And that's already a, a conversation on, a, on its own, right? And so it's not just about, oh, hey, let's just kind of make the um, accuracy of this particular task equal across all groups, right? Um, it's, it's like, well, even when the accuracy is correct, then the way it's used, you know, is, it, can, it can be actually pretty bad. Um, so I, I think it opens up such a, a complex discussion. You know, for example, I just wrote a paper with a history student, Anson, and, um, which I'm excited about because we, we talk about just data collection and we talk about some kind of, um, parallels that we can draw from archival historians and how they collect data and the kinds of issues they face mm -hmm. um, and the kinds of things that they're trying to do to address them. Um, and give so, me an example. Just yeah, like so one example, so one example is, and, and it seems like some of these examples are things that people in the machine learning community are talking about right now. One example is data consortiums. Um, you know, so one issue is with data. I mean, I work at a big corporation like Google, right? And Google has a lot of data on a lot of people and you don't have that much data, you know, so there's a power imbalance there. And, and small startups can't have a lot of data, you know. Um, government bodies might have data that like nonprofits don't. And so how can you pool resources to have data consortiums 
um, maybe it could be for the public good or just for, you know, a bunch of different smaller businesses. But so that those are some of the ideas. Another idea is, um, you know, I, I wrote this paper for, with a lot of people at MSR called Data Sheets for Data Sets. And that one was just around, and it, the inspiration was gender shades. It was around kind of dis, you know, disclosure and documentation of what is in your data or, and um, what, what's in your data set. You know, how did you gather it? Like, what are the characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. And so when in this paper, um, the, you know, we know that like archival historians have a very complicated kind of documentation process and procedures that they write for gathering data. They have a mission, an institutional mission statement. Um, and, and then like the reason that the data is being gathered, the procedural, you know, like how it's gonna be. And there's like layers of supervision at each point, you know? Um, and so uh, that's, that's another example. Yeah, I could definitely see that, you know, if you think about medical papers and everything too, they have to be very, you know, distinct in who was their, their test set and what they were working on. And exactly. so why wouldn't you apply those same types of practices yeah. um, to, to machine learning? Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot is synthetic data and yeah. how we think that synthetic data is actually a way to kind of bridge that moat that these big temp tech companies have built up to, you know, to be on equal footing from a data perspective. And I also personally think that there's a lot of opportunity within synthetic data to help, you know, um, make sure that it is unbiased in nature because you're essentially creating a lot of it. Um, do you think do you think about that at all? Is that something that you you looked at? Um, I think about synthetic data, yeah, like data augmentation um, and, and and practices. I, I I'm actually thinking of a few projects there, like on on that right now. I even like wrote, wrote like a, some of my ideas way way back. But then Emily Denton, who's um, very well known in, in working on generative models, but who's also in our team now at Google. Um, and a bunch of, of us wrote a, um, a paper on using um, kind of uh, generated uh, images um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of augmenting them to test for bias, uh, to test for specific types of bias. So I think that, um, I think that synthetic, you know, like everything, you know, there's issues, with some huge issues with synthetic data sets right now that we're dealing with, right? like deep fakes and stuff like that. Mm. But then um, I do think that it can be used in specific, certain specific um, scenarios, but I would be very careful to not think of it as like the solution to yeah. our problem, right? Yeah. Absolutely. There, there are no absolutes, right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, is there one application of computer vision or deep learning at the moment that gets you really giddy about its potential? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so uh, I am, I'm very interested in low resource settings. So um, the Ernest Mubwazi, who's um, who who is a, a researcher in Accra, it, uh, he has been working with other people on like crop disease identification, mm. um, and so and um, gathering data with farmers and stuff. And I think that like that kind of stuff, the 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 tools that can like help small scale farmers identify disease, those mm. kinds of things, identify um, uh, like uh, you know obviously you know Serge right like he uh, always co-organizes uh, with Ryan and so many other people like the fine grained um, challenge um, at CVPR every every year mm -hmm. and so like sometimes you learn about really really interesting kind of um, applications like that where I know like some of my um, colleagues who would want to like track bird migration patterns and things like that and that helps you understand climate change and what's going on mm -hmm. Anju showed me a really cool, I guess it's called from forensic architecture. Um, okay. Is it there? I think they're at NYU or something like that. A really cool video of using, um, I mean, I, I even think they use synthetic data for training, um, uh, like using uh, computer vision to identify tear gas, um, can, uh, like, uh, I don't know what they're called, uh, manufacturer by specific um, companies and like that are throw you know that are placed you know where migrants are and stuff like that where wow. immigrants are and things like this and I think that's really great 
and all over the world like yeah that's really that's really great because to be honest um some of the use cases of have of vision are are very concerning to me like mm. i hear of like the electronic border wall you know or anything to do yeah. with face recognition is is very worrisome to me right now because of the manner in which it's used mm -hmm. um so when i see th these kinds of things that are kind of you know placing uh like power in the hands of of, of just people that that's that's yeah. kind of what makes me happy that's great would you ever consider starting your own business in this space or joining a startup that was in a, in a, a positive space? Honestly, if I leave Google, I would just start my own thing. I think that I would, I don't know if I would, it, I don't know if it would be a startup. Um, I don't know if it would be like a research institute. I don't know what it would be. But I think that if I leave, which it's hard because I love my team, um, I would what I would do would be start my own thing. <laughs> that's what Very I think. Cool. That's great. That entrepreneurial spirit, right? Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to work this hard, like I just, I'm work, I just, I'm kind of tired of convincing is I, you know, there's a lot of change that needs to happen and it's very difficult to change institutions. And sometimes I learned, I learned this with black and AI and like many times it's easier to do things from scratch that are, you can start small and then that changes institutions right rather than um we are trying to convince you know various kind of like i don't know 100 <laughs> percent. yeah change. there's always you know we we talk a little bit about entrepreneurism versus entrepreneurism right and so affecting change from the inside out or yeah. affecting change from the outside, from the outside in, right? in yeah and so that's great to hear that you know it is something that's on your radar um, yeah <laughs> potentially for the future yeah um well i've taken up enough of your time i just want to i want to give you one last question so if you were going to give one sentence of advice to yourself as a 12 year old girl getting ready to embark into this world of deep tech, what would it be? Oh man. <laughs> um, do you know what it would be? Honestly, it's that to keep that spirit when I was 12 and I can, I can um, expand on that when I was 12 and, um, and I don't know if it was 12, 16, I did not, care what other people thought so mm. i'll give you uh, when I, I remember like when i was 16 i came to audition for you know so i play piano and i uh, i wanted to play jazz and i wanted to go there's this berkeley a very famous jazz school mm. um they had like this summer summer school and i wanted to and it was free and i and i wanted to go there and i auditioned but i didn't know anything about jazz it was only like <laughs> classical music that I learned, right? And I auditioned and like the people are so confused, you know, what's going on because it was not the best. Audit like they're asking me <laughs> stuff. I have no idea what they're asking me. They're asking me to play these things called inversions. And at the time I had no idea what inversions were. And like, you know, I was kind of, I asked them what it was. And so, and so, but I did, and you know, uh, and then I did the audition. It went ter terribly. And I was like, oh, f funny, you know, like I was just like, it was funny for me that it went terribly. And I moved on. But I, what happened is that I really wanted to go to this school. And I, and I said, okay, the thing to do is to audition. And that's it, right? Like now, I think I would care a lot more. I think I would, you know, and so just to keep that spirit of think about what you, what you want to do, what you enjoy. And regardless of, you know, people will tell you all sorts of things that you're, you're, this is not for you, that you're not good at it, that you'll, you'll, you know, have one exam that you, where you get 10 out of a hundred and you're just be like, oh my God, this is not for me. And you're done. Right. Like, and you're, it's just, you know, for the thing that helps me for the most is to, to keep that spirit, which I, I feel like I had a lot more of when I was actually, when I was younger than now i i totally feel you on that one um i think about that a lot as well as you know yeah keep up that that enthusiasm and you know be who you are authentically and genuinely without worrying so much about yeah. everyone around you yeah. well that's great i really appreciate you you taking the time to chat with us and share your insights about the future of where computer vision is going um and look forward to, to collaborating with you more in the future thank you all right bye. thanks so much bye now